Welcome, everybody. This is Dr. Douglas Pernikoff, and my special co-host today, Ms. Marion Brickner. Hi, Doug. Marion's been on as a guest before, and she's an amazing photographer we talked about. And I wanted to right away introduce that you can get Marion at, best thing to do, I guess, is just Google you, right? Marion right, Brickner, exactly. right. B-R-I-C-K-N-E-R, and you'll get directed to her website, and you can learn all about her great skills and see some of the work that she's done that I think is absolutely beautiful. I've worked with so many animal photographers over the 36 years in the business, um, but I've never met anyone that actually captures the soul of the subject, and I think that's what makes it so special. Yeah, how do we do that, actually? How do we do the how does soul? It, how does how do you do that? Capture the soul? Yeah, yeah. I think you have an intuitive your your life experience, everything comes together and makes you the artist that you are. That's what makes people artists. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, I didn't get to finish my introduction. Today we are hosting ourselves. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about general subjects. We'll probably start with a subject about um, the information of specialization in veterinary medicine and how sophisticated our science has become. And again, this is Dr. Douglas Parnikoff and Ms. Miriam Brickner of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. So I thank the audience for listening and we'll get started. Okay, so, great, great. Well, let me just introduce real quickly, just make a few statements. So, you know, when I graduated veterinary medicine, I'd probably say it was, uh, I don't want to say too much, 36 years ago, so I guess I'm kind of old. But um, at that time, it was a different science. I mean, certainly everybody tries to do the best and we had certain technologies like x-ray machines and you know blood work and surgical capabilities and all that kind of good stuff. But as the years went by, the science has worked to develop and become more sophisticated. And what that results in is animals that are living longer significantly and also staying healthier. So we've uh, in, encouraged the science to grow. And of course, in many ways, we've kind of followed the activities that go along in human medicine. And we learn to extrapolate from them, both in the way we treat, the diagnostics we use, and we've expanded all those services. And right now, in St. Louis alone, we're just so blessed with the opportunity to have so many specialists. And we'll talk about some of those specialties, but um, we can do things here in St. Louis that you could do at the finest of veterinary hospital uh, collect, uh, teaching hospitals around the world. There's only like 25 or 26 veterinary colleges in the U.S. alone. The oldest one was actually at the grounds of Brandeis University in, ba in Waltham, Massachusetts. And some of the original buildings are still up there. And of course, they built around there and built a big university system. But that original first U.S. veterinary hospital was a uh, teaching hospital was actually settled there. Interesting. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 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 kind of curious, really, to s if you could tell us one kind of uh, physical instrument that you might be using differently, or has enhanced itself differently from the time that you started out? That's an excellent question. So what I, I mean, there are many. The one I really enjoy is the ultrasound machine. And of course, this has been around in human medicine for many years. And now has been around veterinary medicine. I would say uh, frequently in private practices now, rather than just specialty facilities, I bet that the ultrasounds used in probably 80% or more of veterinary clinics around the US. And, um, they're just amazing. What I love about ultrasound is it's non-invasive, I meaning you don't have to cut open something to make a diagnosis. You can mm. look at it. It doesn't produce a radiation that's dangerous, mm. has electromagnetic waves, and it's three-dimensional instead of an x-ray, which is two-dimensional. So it gives you a whole other perspective to diagnose and work at. And finally, it's lifetime. Wow. So you wow. don't have to, you know, you can tape it, you can photograph, uh, specific scenes that you're you're looking at mm -hmm. and uh, it's become such a an amazing kind of broad utility uh, instrument it's great and it's not that difficult to learn how to do it and then of course there are specialists called radiologists that do that are board certified they also are board certified in ultrasonography so we get the beauty and the opportunity to advance our knowledge of of the medicine the diseases that we're seeing and learn another way to help diagnose them and then hopefully treat them more effectively and quickly on behalf of the animals. So, so here's what I would think. 
So you have a, an individual who's an animal comes in. So an individual animal. Okay. <laughs> an individual who lives in an animal body, let's say. So. Okay. What, give me an example. What comes in there? A dog? Or oh, a... let's just say we got a, oh, for instance, my own Bruno. And I should have mentioned oh, this Bruno. earlier. Yeah. Bruno, our special guest that comes to the show many times, had to have back surgery today. So this is, uh, oh, wow. we didn't use an ultrasound for that, but we, but we used other special diagnostics, an MRI. But oh. anyway, um, you want an animal that would okay, be... Okay, let's say somebody comes in, it's an okay. animal, and you say, hey, let's do an ultrasound. Good. Right? One common situation that we do that all the time is urinary tract infections, okay? okay. So, um, you know, humans have urinary tract infections all the time. They're painful, uncomfortable. You have to urinate a lot. Um, you have frequent episodes of small amounts of urine. You feel uncomfortable. So we get the same story from our pet owners. They say, well, my dog or my cat's been outside trying to urinate 10 times. He stops here, stops there, stops there. And he's just, just tinkling just a little bit. He probably has a problem. So he brings him to us. And the first thing we do is say, well, we need to get a urinalysis. And that's to study the urine. So what we used to do is either wait and catch a sample. And Whoa. this looked kind of weird. We'd put a cup at the end of a pole or uh -huh. some kind of and we chased the dog around in the backyard until they squatted and peed and of course the neighbors think you're crazy it's just like uh, bewitched where the neighbor yeah. across the street was watching all the time yelling at her husband look at look what she's doing <laughs> well that's what that would be us so that's one way but the problem is that's not a pure enough sample and you can get debris along the urinary tract as it exits the body that can distort mm -hmm. your your <clears throat> findings the better way is to be able to put a needle directly into the bladder and then draw a pure sample off and you can culture it, you can do a urinalysis, which means you look at the urine chemically and also you look physically under the microscope. Now, in the past, we could teach ourselves, and we did teach ourselves, how to deliver a needle right into the bladder without, oh, wow. without watching. But with an ultrasound, we can actually watch the needle entering and we can direct the needle right into the bladder you know you're in there, you wow. get a nice sample. How does the uh, individual feel about that? It doesn't hurt. I mean, it, it, you know, it's like a pinch, you know, and, the, really? and we lay the animals down, we don't anesthetize them, and they really handle it beautifully. Now, the other thing you can see with an ultrasound, a couple other things, if God forbid there was a cancer in the bladder wall, you can see a distortion, and it's usually located where the, they call it the trigone area, where the bladder is emptying out into the urethra on its way out the body. Mm -hmm. And right there is where most of those cancers uh, form, in humans as well. So we can see that, which we wouldn't necessarily catch on an x-ray, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And the other thing you can see, if there are stones in the bladder, they will cause a certain reflection down because they distort the signal. Mm -hmm. So you're taught to understand when there's something in the bladder that doesn't belong and typically we're looking for stones or growths, right? Okay, so let, let's see here though. <clears throat> you have this dog mm -hmm. who has a little, presumably a bladder issue. Right. You um, invite the dog mm -hmm. to lie down on a table, right? We have a special padded structure, that, like a V structure that uh. allows them to lay comfortably and, and present on their, they lay on their back with their tummies exposed. Okay, so you explain to him I explained to the dog, I'm please lay still. Lie down. And they right. do. Well, we usually have a little help. A little you know, help. We have, uh, people so, in the front legs and people in the back legs. Oh, really, really? So yeah. the dog says, what? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, okay. All he right. wants to know what the heck's going on. Right. And then you say, oh, we're going to do an ultrasound. And you do something or other. And then something shows up on a screen? Yes, you have a screen, like a lifetime screen. And you're moving your device around that's actually reading the signal on the body, okay? Mm -hmm. And you point and you find the bladder and, and that's something you're trained to do and learn to do. It's very simple because the bladder has fluid or whatever it has, it's kind of black compared to soft tissue all around it that is whiter. So you can say, oh, there's the bladder, it's very simple. And then again, if you see some kind of distortion, either the body wall, the bladder wall is very thickened or you see some kind of irregularity in the wall or you see a stone, reflecting out or you just see something fixed in the wall like a tumor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all those things can be discovered and then you can tap a needle and watch the needle go in 
draw your sample and you have a pure sample that you can culture mm -hmm. for bacteria, you can also submit for other things we look for. Okay, so once you um, put the needle in there, yes, carefully because you have the ultrasound and you're right. very carefully trained, yes, right, and you get the sample, mm -hmm. and then you put the sample someplace. Yeah, then we put it into a sterile collection vial and send it off to the laboratory. Oh, you send it to a lab. Well, we can do parts. Many veterinary clinics will do either all the urinalysis review or part of it. And I always feel like it's better to get the best sample right. to the best location. And certain aspects of the study I might do in the office, like I might look at the pH or test to see if there's any sugar in there, to see if it's diabetic, might do lots of things. All right, you could. You can do some, but you send it <clears throat> to the... It's my know. preference as, at my clinic, yeah. And then you're done, and the dog says okay, and you gets off the table, right? Right, and then we can get a pure culture if the uh, laboratory sees something unique or certain cells, white cells, or certain kinds of bacteria, they'll tell us it in their report, and then we can decide the best way to treat that animal and be most efficient. If they think they need to culture that sample and actually try and describe the specific species of bacteria, because every bacteria has sensitivity to certain mm -hmm. antibiotics, mm -hmm. it gives us the best chance to obviously um, find the right drug for the, for the critter. Is the culturing and the examination of it similar to what would be in a human? Ex I would say it's essentially the exactly. same. Exactly. Yeah. Is the lab that you send it to similar to the labs that human? It's a parallel mirrored image. I mean, they do the same things that the human labs do. And we have sent on a rare occasion a special sample to a human lab. Like sometimes if I'm working with chimpanzees or great apes, uh -huh. It's, uh, and I want to send a, a, a poop sample or a fecal sample, I might send it to a human lab because they're more familiar with the kind of parasites to look for in a great ape or much more similar to the humanoid, right? Do you tell them what, what, where you got it from? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell them they get a kick out of it. In fact, most human uh, medical service programs enjoy doing something with animals because it kind of breaks the monotony of what they do right. day to day. So it's fun. Right. It's fun for them. Isn't that neat? So that's just one little area of specialization. That's an ultrasound machine, and it's a great tool. We usually match it with something like an x-ray. And uh, our radiology has changed, too, dramatically. It used to be just what they call analog uh, radiology, where you'd mm -hmm. take a picture. Mm -hmm. You had to put the thing through a developer with chemicals. Oh, really? And oh. it took time. It was a pain in, in the butt, really. Right. So now what we have are digital x-rays just like the uh, human industry has. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of unusual, but you know, we'll spend a ton of money to have that kind of utility in the clinic, but we get such a great picture. Mm -hmm. And it really, really is. I've actually even, when I first opened my clinic, I had a special x-ray machine called a mammogram machine, uh -huh. just like they use in humans. And it was so great because it has such, like 10 times the acuity and the ability to really focus down on tissue. And I would do that from all the small animals were treated like the little rats and mice and stuff like that. Uh -huh. So I had, I remember one time the specialist came in and he said, Doug, with this machine, you see things we're not supposed to see, but uh -huh. it was kind of fun. Uh -huh. So it's been helpful. So I think it's fun as a veterinarian to extrapolate and learn what we can do to better improve our science. And that's what we're doing. So when you get this new <clears throat> quote, new or different equipment, Mm -hmm. ultrasound do you have to go where do you how do you get trained on it usually if you're investing that kind of uh, money into an asset like that they'll they'll provide some training programs and then continuing education is something that allows you to expand your knowledge base and mm -hmm. do you, you have to go more. somewhere to do that? usually you would have to go through someplace like uh, yeah. they have regional sites where they'll have a three-day or two-day oh. or whatever seminars yeah. and your lifetime you're sitting around doing studies with people that are mentoring you and teaching you how to interpret it. So yeah, it's great. I mean, that's if you want to be a veterinarian, you can go in and just do vaccines all day and that's kind of gets to you. But if you really want to be a doctor where you actually have to practice the knowledge that you have been, you know, provided at vet school and all that money you paid for your education, mm -hmm. then you do it. You do more you can do and then you can, you know, you can tell your people, <laughs> "Hey, we're giving you great service because we've got tools and knowledge to help your pet do the best it can do. Right, and the patients appreciate that. I, mean, I think the, the pet owners do. The people, the people <laughs> yeah. do, people do, because they love, 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 love their animals. Oh my gosh. Um, again, I think there's like uh, 70 or 80 
million pets, pet homes in the United States. Most have more than one pet, dog and cat. Most of them have, I think there's, I can't remember how many different cat homes there are, but everybody is doing a great deal to encourage care for their animals. And I know Mm -hmm. as a veterinarian, I'm as vulnerable as anybody. You know, my, my dogs are like my grandchildren. So if they have a problem like Bruno had, we go the whole way. Sure. We're going to stop for just a moment. We'll take a quick break and then we'll come back to visit some more and continue talking about specialization in veterinary medicine with my co-host, Marion Brickner, and myself, Dr. Douglas Pernikoff. We'll be back in just a minute. Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show is here to provide information and entertain. We're back again into our next section. We're going to continue talking about specialization in veterinary medicine. Again, Dr. Doug Pernikoff from Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, my wonderful special co-host, Marion Brickner. Hi. Who is the most amazing, I keep saying it, the most amazing. Ah, you just say that. No, animal photographer I've ever met, and uh, we'll repeat her access, but if you're interested in getting some customized work for your family or your pets, she's the lady to go to. So, um, and you can look her up at Google at Marion Brickner, B R I C K N E R, or you can look at her website, Marion Brickner Photography.com, and you'll be amazed at the work that you'll see. Anyway, we just uh, ended up talking a little about one specific instrument, uh, the ultrasound, and then we ran into the radiology uh, opportunities that we have nowadays. But there's so many other instruments affecting so many different aspects of our science. For instance, ophthalmology. Yeah, I want to hear about that. Okay, so it's just amazing. I don't even know all the instruments that are being used um, nowadays. But um, just as um, with uh, humans, the exact same tools, they just have to, I guess, modify the way you create the interface between the animal and the machine. Because in humans, we can tell you lean forward and lean into this uh, slip machine or whatever they call it. And they can see everything from the retina on forward, layer by layer. And our veterinary ophthalmologists can do the same things. And uh, so they have slit lamps, they call them. They have the indirect ophthalmoscopes. They have all kinds of fancy stuff. And again, that's just one division, one area. Uh, surgery is amazing. We have orthopedic surgeons who, are surgeons who are doing all kinds of interesting procedures using MRIs. They use... Um, uh, the CT scans and along with x-rays and they can pinpoint specific areas let's say you're uh, in my case Bruno my dog had a slip disc so they can actually look at the entire spine with an MRI determine which ones are most critical to approach and determine whether there's compression on the cord the spinal cord mm-hmm. and should <laughs> surgery be, be done or can we hold off and wait and that's exactly the process that we went through with my dog. So with a regular x-ray, I can get an indication of where there might be narrowing of the card, but I can't see the specific areas of concern. And then with an MRI or a CT scan, you can really pinpoint down. It's amazing. Did Bruno have to be anesthetized for that? Yes, he did. And I think they do that just so they don't have to waste time um, getting just the perfect images. So if you're What they usually do with dogs or cats is they'll kind of anesthetize them and then they'll kind of position them and they'll use some minor tape to kind of keep them so they're still. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how long the procedure takes, but I don't imagine it's very long. It might be 15, 20 minutes. So I had a little question about the anesthetizing. Okay. How do you decide how much to give? Okay, this has all been worked out through the development of the science again. Mm -hmm. And... Every animal is an individual, just like humans, so you should always be ready to anticipate something that's not quite the regular response. But the protocols have been worked out for so long. I've been using protocols for some maybe 36 years. So you know what works for you. Every vet, just like every doctor and every anesthesiologist, has his own favorite formulas and protocols. And then the protocol might be dictated by the procedure you're going to do. So we can give something to a dog that's reversible. Then, in other words, we give them a shot in the, in the vein or in the muscle. They go to a restful sleep, 
and you do your procedure and you can re, you can reverse it with another drug mm -hmm. that uh, is antagonistic to it and they wake up and then go home in 20 minutes it's great wow. wow in other cases you need something like a formal full-blown anesthesia and they they stage anesthesias into four stages with four being the most complete so mm -hmm. you're really out of it you lose all control of all your body functions and you have to sustain the animal or the human you know with sometimes life support devices and then we put all kinds of fancy monitors on them just mm -hmm. like the humans do we'll check their oxygenation we'll check their heart rate we'll look at their heart function with an ekg we can do body temperatures blood pressures all those kind of things mm -hmm. while you're under anesthesia and you want those things for your pet just like you want them for yourself absolutely absolutely and then before we anesthetize them to help us you know make sure we're doing a safe job we're going to give the animal a physical exam, so we're going to listen to their heart, we're going to listen to their lungs, we're going to look in their eyes, look in their mouth, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that gives us one level of protection. Then we draw blood, and we do a blood exam before anyone's anesthetized. And again, that's going to give you more information about the biochemistries. They tell you with all their fancy testing now, mm -hmm. you know, that the liver has some problems, or possibly it's the kidneys or there's a high white count because there might be an infection that we didn't notice. All these things might dicta dictate how we manage our animals or we might postpone a procedure if we're worried. You know, if we have, oh, for instance, another area of science that I think is really interesting is oncology. We actually have board certified oncologists or cancer treatment doctors, veterinarians, and that's what they focus on. And we have to monitor our cancer patients just like human doctors do, human oncologists. We have to do blood tests regularly. We have to mm. check their platelet counts, their white counts, their red counts, and make sure that they're safe to give another round or that they're ex they're responding to certain you know um, treatments. Mm -hmm. So again, the sophistication of the science makes it fun to be a veterinarian yeah, yeah. because it's like a puzzle all the time, right? I mean, the dog can't tell <laughs> us much. Uh, the owners often don't see what we should be able to see as veterinarians. It's not their fault. It's our training and using the tools and using our own knowledge and our intuitiveness as we learn to be good practitioners, then we can see more and do more for the pet. Well, I, I've been in your uh, uh, area clinic, and I've, as, as a photographer sometimes in the <coughs> waiting room, I photograph a cat that lives there and walks uh -huh. around. And I've seen people bring in their animals, and the animals, dogs, and things look all, hey, I'm here to see the real vet. Yeah. I'm gonna get really good attention in here. Yeah, you can tell in their in their faces. I think uh, you know the whole idea is to make the atmosphere of the clinic warm and friendly as best you can. Some pets are gonna come in nervous no matter what you do, uh, but I also always find that it's it's everybody's demeanor helps influence you. Probably as a photographer working with the mm -hmm. animals too, somehow you can read the animal. You know what you're trying to get in your case, what kind of picture you're trying to get, and somehow your behavior as a stranger doing this is going to impact how they're going to respond, right? I mean, I, I think so. Yeah, and I see that in myself, you know, that I have to, if I can go in relaxed and I can present myself to the pet and I get close to him and try and pet him or connect with him in some way, that really helps. And it also helps the parents know that you're mm -hmm. trying to do the right thing. If you just come in like a robot, do your thing and walk right. out, that's not what people That's want. That's not fun. Not and fun. so I always liken our service to uh, pediatrics. You know, if you take your kid into the clinic, you want the doctor and the nurses to take care of it, perform and act nicely to your child. Mm -hmm. And they people still expect the same thing from our veterinarians. And I think, you know, veterinarians become veterinarians. I've said this before, I think, on the radio. More veterinarians are veterinarians because of a true love for animals then I imagine many doctors go into medical science, <laughs> not necessarily for any love of people. Uh, but um, so I think that's neat about who we are. We're giving usually very empathetic kind mm -hmm. of uh, science mm -hmm. and it's fun. So that's me, that's my, that's my little advertisement for veterinary medicine. A couple other areas that I think are fun to talk about. So again, in surgery, they can be specialized to neurosurgery, soft tissue surgery, which is anything could be a liver biopsy or whatever um, and then of course the orthopedics fixing bones fixing spines whatever and then um, you look at other things like medicine well that's broad we've already talked about oncology there are dermatologists allergists mm -hmm. there are neurologists who just focus on those particular areas hematologists and on and on 
and when you get trained as a veterinarian, it's it's a little bit more challenging, I think, than in some cases in humans because you have so many species that, uh, you know coming at you. Yeah. And there's a lot of idiosyncratic physiology, biochemistry, and just behavior that are going to impose themselves on you as a clinician. And you have to work hard to kind of learn as much as you can. Uh, well, what are some of the animals that come to you? Oh, well, heck, in our clinic, um, I can't think of too many animals that don't, types of animals that don't come to us. So I've never seen a platypus, but just about anything else I've worked at, either at the zoo where you get all the exotics or in our clinic where we actually get not only dogs and cats, but we get all kinds of exotics. We call one class, we call them uh, pocket pets. So those are the rats and rodents and the things, the rabbits, those are the animals that make great pets for people mm -hmm. if they don't want just the traditional pet. Mm -hmm. We get reptiles in, we get fish, believe it or not. We also have uh, all kinds of birds. And um, then we get up to more exotic species. And those might be, you know, some sort of ringtail possum or, um, you know, a more exotic cat or bird. Uh, we get raptors, birds of prey, like hawks and owls and eagles. Mm -hmm. And then occasionally we even get what we call our super exotics. That might be a primate, like a monkey or an ape. And, uh, or we, we've had camels and uh, really? in your reindeer clinic? right outside. <laughs> we've had reindeers walk right in and went reindeer walk right in. Uh -huh. And we have alpaca and llama come in pigs all kinds of pigs and i think we had one show where we talked about suburban farming but pot-bellied pigs are terribly uh popular now so are chickens as pets because mm -hmm. there's so many beautiful breeds and we see duck species and i mean i really there isn't too much that i wouldn't uh, wouldn't look at you know it's fun and that's the diversity that makes it more exciting so, so let me ask you this yes all of these different species all have the same kinds of stuff inside, right? Right, right. They have a heart. Right. Lung. Yeah. So the basic, you have to be creative and resourceful in, in uh, veterinary medicine if you're doing multiple species. And you're right. I always, uh, people that get freaked out in vet school, they go, well, I can't do that. I don't want to work with exotics. My attitude is, that's what makes science so interesting is the diversity. And I think before I get into it any further, we're going to take one more quick break, and we'll come back and talk about that interesting topic. So it's Dr. Douglas Pernikoff and Marion Brickner, and we're here at Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. We'll be back in just a moment. If we can count on you, Scooby-Doo, I know we'll catch that bitter. Hey folks, we're back one more time and uh, we're in our third section of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show and my co-host Marion and I are talking about specialization in veterinary medicine and really only have touched the, the surface. There's so much that we could talk about. But you were directing a question at me just before the break. What was that? Right. I, at one point, was able to document an operation for a gorilla. Uh-huh. Fascinating. Uh-huh in the Jacksonville, Florida Zoo, and the keepers had to get, put a sling in his uh, place where he lived, put a sling under him, uh -huh. and carry him, because about 10 or 12 keepers on each side, carry him across the yard into the hospital yes. on the operating table. Wow. So. I've had experiences like that. So one, yeah. one great story I'll tell you is uh, we had a, new gorilla that came to us i was at the fort Rousseau, and this big male silverback was just beautiful but he had been moved out of his home that had been his home in another zoo for probably since his childhood and this was strange and different we had a new great looking facility but he had to be kind of isolated initially and then eventually introduced to the females but we noticed he was losing weight so what do you do with a you know, whatever, 700 pound gorilla or 600 pound gorilla, whatever it is, and, you know, do it safely for his right. sake and our sake. So I scheduled a, a workup, and what I did was I invited um, the human hospital uh, components. We had a uh, cardiologist, we had a gastroenterologist, we had two anesthesiologists because mm -hmm. they wanted to be involved. And uh, we started with that group. We, they brought some nurses. They brought their technologies. And we actually 
anesthetize. I do the anesthetizing. I use a blow dart, mm -hmm. and we get them down, and then we put them on a surgical room in our surgical prep room and intubate them, and we start an exam. And I guessed, I was just guessing, but everything we did, we, we scoped him with a gastroscope, found out that he had an ulcer, which uh -huh. went along with his uh -huh. weight loss and not feeling good. Uh, we did blood work, of course, and found out that he was pretty stable there. The cardiologist did EKGs and all kinds of reviews. They did echo on him using the echo mm -hmm. ultrasound. And uh, I mean, we just did, a, we had a dentist there, we did a dental review. Uh -huh. And I'm really thinking that probably by the time we got through, we probably did a $50,000 or $75,000 review if we were in a human hospital yeah, getting yeah. the same workup. And of course, these people all donated their work because right. they were so excited to get close to a, a gorilla. You know? right, right. I mean, an anesthesiologist has never done this before, right? Or a right. cardiologist. So I love the idea that we could share the science, medical science, mm. across species lines. And um, it was really interesting. So at the end of this, we decided, okay, so he's got an ulcer, we know that. Everything else seems to be good. We awakened him, and he was still kind of depressed. We were getting him medicated for the ulcer. So I invited a uh, psychiatrist to come in. Uh -huh. So I had a, a human psychiatrist came, and um, I thought he was a little crazy myself, but anyway, he was knowledgeable. And he sat and watched the gorilla in the cage interacting with his other animals and just hanging around and he came for whatever reason to the conclusion that he was depressed uh -huh. so we put him on some prozac along with his ulcer medicine uh -huh. and in no time <laughs> he was a normal gorilla and he really? was acting yeah i mean it was just so great how long did he have to stay on the prozac uh you know he stayed on for at least a good six months and really? then i think we weaned him down oh. but it was just a you know it was a great example of how we can do that and this happens all the time you know that humans in the dental field or some specialization in ophthalmology they love to touch the world of exotics because it's so interesting and so different so right. it's I've not been doing that, that, that different as it turns out well not that and that's what you were asking me before the break was that uh, you know when you work across so many uh, species lines you do see a lot of variation uh, that's unique or idiosyncratic to a specific animal group or an animal i mean even down to the species line Mm -hmm. But um, broadly, they all have basic fundamental similarities or commonalities. They all have something to breathe through, something mm -hmm. to eat with, you know, to move. And again, I've talked about this topic before, but the whole subject of form and function in the animal world is what makes it so interesting to me is that why is an animal built and function a certain way to survive in its unique ecological space? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how does a... Uh, arboreal animal become an arboreal animal. Well, you have a, a tail that works like a hand, you know, in mm -hmm. uh, prehensile tailed uh, monkeys and stuff. Um, why did bats, you know, learn to fly? You know, what made them forced to fly? Well, they wanted to get the fruits and the berries at the ends of the tree mm -hmm. that the bigger animals couldn't get out to. So there was a whole new resource available. So over time, something, whatever those steps are, encouraged them. <laughs> to modify their hands into a wing web expanded and they could finally compete for mm -hmm. those special resources. And I think that's what makes animal, I mean, you must, as a photographer also, I know you did a whole subject on praying mantids at one time, didn't you? Oh, oh sure, praying mantises and dragonflies. Dragonflies, and I mean, what do, you, what, what do you see that, you know, the average person doesn't look and see much beyond, oh, there it is, isn't that interesting? But I think as a photographer, you probably look at their form. Well, here's an interesting thing about dragonflies. I, I think that each individual, you know, my whole thing is if you're, you're an individual lives in the body you happen to have, and you have mm -hmm. that life, and you happen to be a dragonfly. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a certain species of dragonfly, you have certain kinds of mites mm -hmm. that like you, mm -hmm. but they don't like all of you. Ah. They would like a certain wing. Uh-huh. And only a part of that wing do they enjoy. So that's a very specific kind very of uh, specific, relationship. Very specific relationship. And they hang around on that part of that wing for that particular species of dragonfly wow. to get to the next location where oh. the dragonfly so is So they're going. just using them as a transport, not to yes. damage them? right. The wow. same thing with American burying beetles. Uh -huh. American burying beetles, I did a project here at the St. Louis Zoo 
Uh, some of my pictures are in the Nature Conservancy magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, with American bearing beetles, by the way, a boy American bearing beetle has a, a square on the top of his head. Uh -huh. A girl would have a triangle. Wow. I, so what's the significance of those, I wonder? They can tell each other apart. <laughs> no, is that it? Yeah, I, mean, I, I thought the guy was kind of square. You know, no, that, that's no, not it at all. No, handsome, handsome boy American <laughs> bearing beetles. And they have mites that get on them to get to the next site. Mm -hmm. And the beetle goes over there to eat that whatever it is that dead in the thing. Uh, and to lay its, dig a hole and bury it and lay its larva in there. The mites get off, eat the fly larva uh -huh. that have already been there, eat the fly larva so that the beetle has free access to lay its larva there without any fly larva interfering. Well, that's what I was asking. Um, I was wondering about the relationship you're kind of describing as a commensalism is what we call it in biology, where each species that's interconnected and they, they rely on each other in their relationship in life, hmm. it has some kind of benefit that goes back right. and you just described it perfectly. So that's our new word for the day, commensalism. I okay? didn't know that. You'll be tested later. All right, great. So yeah, I mean, so as an, again, as a uh, photographer, you look at form and you find certain stories that come out of it. The natural history behind the animals is what makes it fun as well. Don't yeah. you agree? It makes it fun to think that this, this little guy or that girl is having her life, and we never even, that the small individuals that I photograph, like Dragonfly, we don't even think of them as having a particular life that they're doing. Right. We just say, oh, there's a dragonfly. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, I like to bring the idea that there's somebody actually with a life there doing something. So that's why I tell these stories. Uh, that's great. That's, I, I think we both appreciate that's fun about the biological world. Right. I definitely. mean, there are people that do that in human medicine. They probably call themselves psychologists or something, <laughs> but, or behavioralists. So uh, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I even have some books out about that. So check me out on Amazon. I've <laughs> produced 40 books. Oh, four, my God. Four zero. And that's topics across all species, and, and oh. I know you like subjects with, the, obviously, the bonobos. We've, we've had you here as a guest. Bonobos, cats, dogs, dragonflies, all, all kinds of stuff. Cool. All and people, too, right? No. Well, you do. I've seen people with your family pet connections. You've seen some where you put the people with the pet. Oh, I did one on called Mutts and Rascals, where I photographed children with their dog. Uh huh. And I think horses. I've seen something with people, but well, I don't like putting people. <laughs> you don't like people. Okay, good. No, no, no. I mean, it's it's just. Um, it's not your subject. It's whenever we see an image with a person in it or a couple of people, our mind goes to say, or maybe a group, we say, "Hey, where's the, where's the different size? Where's the different color person? Where's the this and that and this and the right away?" There's criticism, criticism, and um, I, I don't like that. So, so with the pets and the animals, you have a free range, right. and you can do what you want as you want. Right. Right? So I think some of my favorite pictures, I, I'm just thinking out loud, are when you have a collection of two or three animals of the same family, and they're together, and the relationship be, as mm -hmm. they sit and pose. And again, the way you get those poses, and you get the most beautiful aspect of those animals. It's I really, just ask them. Do you ask him? I've photographed your three dogs sitting on a couch. Right. Looking right, right into the camera, smiling. Right, right. And you just ask them if you would please um, sit there and smile, and they say, okay. <laughs> it happens over and over. Well, I have special dogs. They're so amazing and brilliant. Yes. Exactly. True. So, again, um, the specialization, just to summarize, in veterinary medicine, to me, is just so exciting, but it's really exciting for the pet owner because we can do so much more to extend the life and the healthy life and functional life of your pets by applying all these new diagnostics, learning more about our science, and offering more treatment protocols to keep your critters where they should be in your home, happy and healthy. Right. So I think in just a few moments, we're going to break away for our final segment. We'll come back and kind of recap. And I wanted to talk a little bit about a special subject that's pertinent to this time of year. So in just a moment, Marion Brickner and Dr. Doug Pernikoff from Dr. Doug's All Things Animal radio show will be back to visit with you.
Here we are once more. We're in our final segment of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and we're going to do a little recap. We uh, talked today in generality about the specialization in veterinary medicine. What was the most interesting point to you? The new, the newer, for want of a better word, equipment, mm-hmm. and how we have been able to transfer equipment being used for humans to being applied. also applied yeah. to animals. And we love them so much. We do. We do. And uh, we talked a little bit about Marion's experience, and we talked about form and function and how to enjoy the animal world as we see it. Marion, give us your best contact information one more time. The best way to reach me and the most fun and easiest is just put my name in Google. That's Marion, M-A-R-I-A-N, Brickner, B-R-I-C-K, Brick. You can tell what the kids called me in school <laughs> n-e-r n is in nancy so b-r-i-c-k-n-e-r so if you're interested in any kind of customized uh, photography or just find some of the work she's done she's written books you can acquire whatever you need through her and again if you're looking for our trainer cindy vickers who's not here today my co-host you can call her at our clinic 636-530-1808 and you can reach me at that same number at the Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic. I wanted to real quickly mention something I'm concerned about this time of year, and that's excess of heat, heat exhaustion, and prostation in animals. And I just want people to know, with these crazy temperatures, just don't ever assume that the animal can tolerate something. So excess of walking and running exercise, you need to do that pre-sun and post-sun. And you have to watch them. It doesn't take much for these animals with coats on to get overheated. Signs might be mild to extreme. They can just kind of be panting. They can even go so far as just kind of collapsing and going into shock. So um, please be careful. Uh, Sitting in the car for 10 minutes at 70 degrees with the windows up is enough to cause heat exhaustion and possible death in your pets. We know it's a problem with children. Certainly it's the same process with our pets. Treatment's always an emergency. You have to run to the emergency clinic or to your doctor, get them cooled down. You might have to ice them down or alcohol between the legs, anywhere to get that temperature down. Often those temperatures can get up to 106 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's, again, very deadly. What happens is tissue dies, and it kind of tries to get cleared out of the the system through the kidneys, and you end up uh, killing your kidneys and other parts of your body. So prevention is the name of the game. Take water with you, cool water. Trim your dogs down, uh, get their coats down during the summer if you can. Watch out for sunburn on areas that don't have a lot of hair. And just use common sense, just like you do with your children. Do the same thing. And that's my message for today. And I just want to thank everyone. I especially want to thank my dear friend and co-host, Miriam Breckner, who has come to fill in for Cindy this week. She's done a great job. And I want to thank my audience for listening to us again. This is Dr. Doug Pernikoff. And sit and Marion Brickner. I was going to call you Sydney Brickner. <laughs> uh, the Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. And we'll talk to you next week with another exciting show. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. <laughs>